Hot springs are extreme ecosystems. Very few species can live here. But many of the microbes that live here are major new groups of life that have never been explored by science before. And all this work to understand what they are starts with genomics. If you want to travel back in time to discover the very origins of life, this is the place to start. Hot springs like these represent a similar environment to what was on Earth four billion years ago. We can use genomics to discover new organisms that were unknown to science. Brian Hedlund from the University of Nevada is studying these organisms. Who knows what new properties these might have? We're almost at freezing temperature, yet in some part of the springs, the water is actually boiling. Back here, we have an old lake, a Pleistocene lake, and there are brine deposits, uh, sodium chloride deposits. This water uh, fell as rain or snow probably 10,000 years ago. And that's what we have out here is, is geothermally heated water, salty water. It's really weird stuff, and that's where the microbes are living. And the water is quite clear. What kind of organisms are here? There is actually life there. There are bacteria and there are archaea, and then there are viruses that attack those bacteria and archaea. Some of these lineages are, are really deep lineages on the tree of life. So these probably diverged from other known lineages of microbes probably over a billion years ago. How do these organisms survive in such an extreme environment? They have very special uh, biochemical adaptations. One thing they have is very special membranes. And most people are used to thinking about lipids as having a, a bilayer, so two different layers, but these have the hydrophobic portion of the lipids are covalently bound. And so those lipids are, are stuck and they can't delaminate. And that's one thing that's really special about life at high temperature. They have special adaptations on how their DNA is packaged. They have different amino acid contents in their proteins. Where do they get their energy from? Because uh, usually you think of, of uh, a chemical source for energy. Photosynthesis doesn't occur above 73 degrees Celsius. So, so the ecosystem works a little differently. And traditionally, people think that microbes here use volcanic gases. But here we have plants living pretty close to the edges of the springs. So you have plants falling in and insects falling in. And that actually adds a decent amount to the energy budget and to the nutrients that the microbes here use. The organisms that's in here, where do they come from? Are they from uh, underwater springs? A lot of the microbes we have here are closely related to microbes that we see in Yellowstone. And there is definitely a possibility that there are conduits, you know, aquifers. But also, microbes do pass in the upper atmosphere, and you maybe only need a few. So I think there's a mixture of those two processes going on. These conditions here are so different from how you normally culture bacteria in the, in the lab. How do you study them individually? Because these are mixtures. We need to study them as individuals. We do still try to grow them in the lab, and we've been very successful. We've identified and discovered two new classes of bacteria in the past few years in a new order. Some of them don't like us. <laughs> and so they're out there and they say, you know, we don't want to grow in the lab. We're not patient enough to fail for years and years. And so we go after them genomically. We can sample the microbial community in the water by pumping it through a filter, which would collect bacteria and archaea above 0.2 microns. Back in the lab, we can break open the filter unit and take the filter paper and put it through a bead beading process that will vigorously lyse the cells. After lysing the cells, we will go through a series of centrifugation filtration steps, which will extract the DNA. The information that you then gain, can you use that to, to try and, and grow them again? Absolutely. Once we have access to the genomes, we can make predictions, and once in a while, we're smart enough to actually succeed at that. We've been able to grow new classes in the lab, you know, equivalent maybe to, to, to discovering mammals or, or birds or something like that. One of them 
is uh, called the, the thermoflexia. And so these are, make really long, thin, beautiful cells. Another related microbe is a new order that is called the calotenuales. And so that microbe we call calotenue paparoliticum, which means sort of thin beauty eating paper. You mentioned that you have identified new phyla of organisms. Can you tell us more about that? One example of phyla that we're looking at is a group that we've called atri bacteria. It means dark bacteria because they're, they've been dark from science for so long. They also only live in dark habitats. Another new group we're looking at in phylum is called fervidibacteria. Fervida uh, referring to high temperatures. We don't often hear about viruses in hot springs, uh, and they must be having a tough time because they don't have a lot of material there. There's not a lot there, so you've got a virus here that has to get into a host cell pretty quickly and efficiently. Viruses certainly uh, you know, play a major role in the dynamics of populations of creatures. The only way I've studied them is with genomics. When we sequence viral genomes, the vast majority of those genes just look like they're from outer space. And that's really exciting, and really exciting for biotechnology too, because viruses have a lot of enzymes that process uh, nucleic acids, DNA and RNA, and those are really useful for industry. I think that's just kind of the tip of the iceberg for things that could be used in technology and could really you know, touch people's lives, both with industry and, and medicine. It's amazing how much of the invisible world still remains undiscovered. And genomics is the key to uncovering these organisms and their enzymes.